Okay, this brings us to question four, the last question this week. In dealing with the patient's confabulation, the professor makes no mention of challenging it. Is that the best approach, to listen and simply accept it as a telling insight into how the person's mind is making sense of their world? Uh, the answer is no. Um, I, uh, because uh, when I spoke of this patient, uh, this confabulating patient, because I didn't go on to speak of what one does with such a patient, uh, it doesn't imply that my belief is that one does nothing. Um, and that is to say, it doesn't imply that my belief is that one does not challenge confabulations. It is certainly true that confabulations give a telling insight um, into the, the, the structure of the mind of the person making the confabulation. But I believe that confabulations should be challenged. I don't think that they should be challenged in the way that the word challenge implies. I don't mean that you have to confront the patient and say, no, 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 that's simply not true, that isn't real. Uh, you get nowhere like that. Uh, that's why understanding the insights that confabulation provides uh, into the structure of the mind, into why the person is confabulating, what the purpose, the mental purpose of the confabulation is, uh, is very valuable knowledge in terms of preparing you as to what you should do about it. Um, if you understand what the patient is avoiding in reality, which is what is always the case, what is being avoided by virtue of the confabulation, then you have valuable knowledge in terms of understanding what the patient's up to, what's motivating them, and that in turn guides um, what you do next. So you don't say to the patient, no, what you're saying isn't true. You say to the patient, I understand that this is upsetting you, that this is, a, this is of concern to you, and that is why you, you've, you, you, you prefer to look at it this way. Uh, in this way, you can make contact with the feeling world of the patient and... Um, in this way, you have a much better chance of, of uh, persuading them um, uh, out of the confabulation. When I say that last thing, persuading them out of the confabulation, I need to make explicit something which I think is really quite basic and therefore quite important to say. I think it's a general ethical principle in clinical work that it is always best to face reality. It's an ethical principle in the sense, uh, not of, of a moral principle, it's an ethical principle in the sense of good versus bad. It is better to face reality than to avoid it. That's the ethical principle upon which uh, I believe um, all of our clinical work rests. And why? Uh, the reasoning is that reality exists. Like it or not, uh, unpleasant as it may make you feel, um, if a fact is there, it's going to be there even if you avoid it. And uh, when you avoid it, you have less chance of being able to contend with it, less, less chance of being able to think up a solution, a realistic solution as to how you can contend with it, which ultimately means as to how you can best meet your needs in the world, given the constraints that the world actually presents. So even in the most extreme forms of mental illness, um, confabulation is uh, not far removed from delusion and, uh, and, and hallucination and the like. Uh, in my clinical work, I always um, try my best to help the patient to get to a point where they're able to face reality, or I, I try to take them as far as I can down the road of facing reality. Uh, I never collude with confabulations, but that doesn't mean I hit them over the head. Okay, see you next week, which will be the last time. Thank you.